Now, you see, what is, uh, let me speak specifically for a moment, I said the subject of this is LSD. LSD is one such chemical that does produce this curious effect of making you aware of the polarity of things. It does lots of other things. It does lots of rather unessential and trivial things. And these, of course, in all the publicity in the various national magazines about LSD get thoroughly emphasized. In other words, when somebody says something's real psychedelic, they mean bizarre. And when the national magazines try to illustrate the effect of these chemicals with various photographs, they come on with blurred photographs of all sorts of things higgledy-piggledy messed together, uh, naked girls seen through prisms. <laughs> well, that's absolutely nothing to do with it. If uh, you wanted some sort of appropriate illustration for a Life magazine article on the effects of LSD, uh, you would have one very simple solution. You would publish the most gorgeous color reproductions of Persian miniatures and of uh, Moorish arabesques and of the illuminations of Celtic manuscripts. That would give you the story so far as changes in human sensation are concerned. But there would be one thing very difficult to put across in pictures, because the people who looked at them, if they didn't get the point of view, wouldn't see it. And that is what I will call the sensation, as well as the intellectual understanding, of polarity. That is to say that the inside and the outside the subjective and the objective, the self and the other, go together. In other words, uh, what, uh, there is a harmony, an unbreakable harmony. I'm, when I'm using the word harmony, I don't necessarily mean something sweet. I mean absolute uh, concordant relationship between what goes on inside your skin and what goes on outside your skin. It isn't that what goes on outside is so powerful that it pushes around and controls what goes on inside. Equally so, it isn't that what goes on inside is so strong that it often succeeds in pushing around what goes on outside. It is very simply that the two uh, processes, the two behaviors, are one. What you do is what the universe does. And what the universe does is also what you do. Not you in the sense of your superficial ego, which is a very small, little tiny area of your conscious sensitivity, but you in the sense of your total psychophysical organism, conscious as well as unconscious. This is not something that arrived in the world from somewhere else altogether that confronts an alien reality. What you are is the universe, in, a, in fact, the works, what there is, and always has been, and always will be forever and ever, performing an act called a John Doe. And this is such a subversion of common sense, but is, in fact, matter of fact, something, if you stop to think about it, that is completely obvious. Only everything conspires to prevent you from seeing that obvious thing. Because when you were babies, practically, all your parents and your teachers and your aunts and uncles and your older brothers and sisters got together and they told you who you were. They defined you as Johnny, who is just Johnny. And, and, and don't you come on too strong, Johnny, because, um, <laughs> no, you've got elders and betters around here. But you're responsible. You're a free agent. You'd better be. <laughs> and so, when you are told from childhood that you are expected and commanded to behave in a way that will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily, you remain permanently mixed up. <laughs> that, if anything, is permanent brain damage. <laughs> So, but that's the idea, you see, because that's the game we're playing. You started it. I didn't. 
<laughs> See? That's the game we're playing. And we can make all kinds of complexities out of that. And really, in a way, have enormous fun. But once anybody sees through that, well, we are frightened. Once you get this sense of polarity, of your inside being the same process as your outside, and your ego being one and the same process as the whole universe going on, then we are afraid that people may say, well, good equals bad, and we can do anything we like, and we didn't in any way be further subject to the ordinary rules of human conduct, and uh, we can wear what clothes we like or no clothes at all, we can have what sexual life we like, we can do anything, and uh, we are going to generally, because the world is being rather oppressive towards us, challenge the whole thing and run amok. And a lot of people are doing just exactly that. So I want to introduce into this whole problem some ancient wisdom. I have really two things to talk about. How cultures, which always did know in some way, or uh, among whom a large number of people always did know this secret, handled it. And then I want to make some observations about how we are trying to handle it and how it's not going to work. Among the Hindus and among the Buddhists, this view of the real identity of a human being has always been known, at least by a very influential minority. The central doctrine of the Hindu way of life, I call it that rather than a religion, is in Sanskrit, tattvamasi, you're it. I put it in a kind of colloquial way. You're it. And it is the which than which there is no witcher, which they call the Brahman, or the Atman with a capital A, meaning the self. You are only just kidding that you're just poor little me. See, the function of a guru, that is to say a spiritual teacher in India, is to look, give you a funny look in the eye because you come to him and say, Mr. Guru, I have problems. I, I, I suffer and uh, it's a mess and I can't control my mind and I'm miserable and depressed and so on. And he gives you a funny look. And you feel a bit nervous about the way he looks at you because, he th you know, he's reading your thoughts. And this man is a great magician. He can read everything that's in you. He knows right down into your unconscious, and you know all the dreadful things you've thought, and all the awful desires you have, and you are rather embarrassed that this man looks right through you and sees them all. But that's not what he's looking at. <laughs> he's giving you a funny look for quite another reason altogether. Because he sees in you the Brahman, the Godhead, just claiming it's poor little me. And he's going to eventually, by all sorts of subtle techniques that are called in Sanskrit upaya, that in politics means chicanery, and in spiritual education means skillful pedagogy. <laughs> he is going to try and kid you back into realizing who you really are. And that's why he gives you a funny look. And why he seems to see right through you. As if to say, Shiva, oh boy, don't kid me. I know who you are. But you're coming on beautifully in this act. <laughs> that you're somebody else altogether. And I congratulate you, you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> playing this part, which you call the person. My person, you know, a person is a fake. It, the, the word means a mask. So if you read books on how to be a real person, you're reading books on how to be a genuine fake. <laughs> the word persona, as you know, means a mask, worn in uh, Greek or Roman drama. So if you I say, come on to the guru and say, well, he asks you who you are, Sri Ramana Maharshi, when anybody came to him and they said to him, as people do, who was I in my last incarnation? Or will I be reincarnated again? He always replied, who's asking the question? <laughs> and everybody was irritated because he wouldn't give them answers about what they were in their former lives. He just said, who are you? And he looked at you. Have you looked at photographs of this man? I keep a photograph of him uh, close by because of the humor in his eyes. They're looking at you with a dancing twinkle, saying, come off it. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Now then, in these Asiatic traditions, it is well recognized that people who get the knowledge that you're it may very well run amok. And therefore, they always couple any method of gaining this, whether it is yoga, whether it is uh, smoking something or drinking something or whatever is the method, they always couple it with a discipline. Now, I know the word discipline isn't very popular these days. And uh, I would like to have a new word for it. Because most people who teach disciplines don't teach them very well. They teach it with a kind of uh, violence. As if a discipline was something that is going to be extremely unpleasant and that you're going to have to put up with. But that's not the real secret of discipline. I would prefer to use the word skill. Discipline is a way of expression. Say you want to express your feelings in stone. Now stone doesn't give way very easily. It's tough stuff. And so you have to learn the skill or the discipline of the sculptor in order to express yourself in stone. And so in every other way, whatever you do, you require a skill. And it's enormously important, especially for American people, to understand that there is absolutely no possibility of having any pleasure in life at all without skill. Money doesn't buy pleasure. Ever. Look, if you want to get stoned drunk and go out and get a bottle of bourbon and down it, you can't do that except for people who have practiced the distiller's art. You can't even make love without art. Where I live in Sausalito, we have a harbor full of ever so many pleasure craft. Motor cruisers, sailing boats, all kinds of things. And they never leave the dock. <laughs> all that happens with them is their owners have cocktail parties there on Saturdays and Sundays because they discovered having bought these things that the discipline of sailing is difficult to learn and takes a lot of time and they didn't have time for it so they just bought the thing as a status symbol so in other words um, you, you can't have pleasure in life without skill but it isn't a unpleasant task to learn a skill if the teacher, in the first place, gets you fascinated with it. There is immense pleasure in learning how to do anything skillfully. To make carpentry things, to cook, to write, to calculate, anything you want. It can be immensely pleasurable to learn uh, the discipline. And it is completely indispensable. Because, look, you may be a very inspired musician. I, I'm not a, a musical technologist, you see, and I regret it, but I'm a word, word technologist. But I can hear in my head all kinds of symphonies and all kinds of marvelous compositions, but I don't have the technique to write them down on paper and share them with somebody else. Too bad. Maybe next time around. <laughs> <laughs> But you see, so far as words are concerned, I can express ideas because I have studied language. And I have worked very hard. Uh, not that I didn't like it, I intensely enjoy the work of writing a book, although it is difficult. But it's fascinating to say what can never possibly be said. <laughs> so, uh, do you see what's happening? What you have to do, you have inspiration, but then you have to have technique to incarnate, to express your inspiration. That is to say, to bring heaven down to earth. And to express heaven in terms of earth. Of course, they are really one behind the scenes. But there's no way of pointing it out unless you do something skillful. You see, we are all, at the moment, absolutely in the midst of the beatific vision. We are all uh, one with the divine, or some... I don't like that sort of wishy-washy language. But we are all there. But we are so much there that we're like fish in water. They don't know they're in water. Like the birds don't know they're in the air because it's all around them. And in the same way, we don't know what the color of our eyes is. 
I don't mean whether you've got blue or brown eyes, but the color of the lens of your eye. You call that transparent. No color. See, because you can't see it. But it's basic to being able to see anything. So in order to find out where you are, there has to be some way of drawing attention to it. And that involves skill. Upaya in Sanskrit. Skillful means. So, it's all very well. Anybody can have ecstasy. Anybody, as a matter of fact, can become uh, aware that he is one with the eternal ground of the universe. But since that's what you are anyway, I'm going to ask, so what? When a hero goes on an adventure, and he leaves his people, and is going to a strange land, he can go away and just hide himself around the corner in an obscure house, and then appear a year later and say, I've been on a heroic journey, and tell all sorts of tales. And they say, prove it. Because they expect him to bring back something, something which nobody has seen before. Then they believe you've been on the journey. And so in the same way, exactly, anybody who goes on a spiritual journey must bring something back. Because if you just say, oh man, it was a gas. <laughs> Anyone can say that. <laughs> now this is why in the doctrines of Buddhism there is a differentiation between two kinds of enlightened beings. They are both forms of Buddha, which is to say the word Buddha means somebody who has awakened, who has discovered the secret behind all this. And in other words, all this thing we call life with its frantic concerns is a big act which you, in your unconscious depths, are deliberately setting up. So, you can do one of two things when you discover this. You can become what's called a Pratyeka Buddha, that means a private Buddha, who doesn't tell anything. Or you can become a Bodhisattva. A Pratyeka Buddha goes off into his ecstasy, and never is seen again. Bodhisattva is come, one who comes back and appears in the everyday world and plays the game of the everyday world by the rules of the everyday world. But he brings with him upaya. He brings with him some way of showing that he's been on the journey, that he's come back, and he's going to let you in on the secret too. If you, if, 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 you'll play it cool and also come back, to join in the everyday life of everyday people. Because this is the rule. If the world is dramatic, if the world, as the Hindus say, is a big act put on by the divine self, one of the rules of coming on stage is that you don't come on as yourself. You come on as the part that you're going to play. It's very bad form if an actor always acts the same way. That's what's called a star, as distinct from an actor. <laughs> a real actor can become anything. And so, but in private life, well, he's just Mr. Jones. And, but he doesn't come on the stage that way. So in the same way, if you know that behind the scenes, in the depths, fundamentally, you are it, you don't come on that way. It always comes on as something else. That's the rule of the stage. Because without that, there wouldn't be a play. There would only be reality. No illusion. And the whole point of life is illusion. From the word Latin, ludere, to play. Showbiz. The show must go on, so don't give it away. But the truth has a way of leaking. It gets out. But then the important thing is, you see, when the truth gets out, those who catch hold of it must find a way of staying in contact with what society calls reality. That is to say, if you have a radio, you don't only need an antenna, you also need a ground. So what happens in the world of mysticism, 
of uh, psychedelic visions and so on needs to be grounded. So then there are always two uh, directions in which such a discipline works. One, preparatory. In other words, those who taught disciplines for awakening in the Orient were always careful to screen, first of all to screen those who applied, and then after screening them to uh, make them sensible so that they knew how to handle the game and of ordinary human existence and play it by the ordinary human rules. In other words, that they had strength of character and were not the sort of people who would be wiped out because they had no strength of character by an overwhelming experience. Then they let them in. But there are certain disciplines such as Zen where you get into the essential secret very early on in the discipline. And after that, they are concerned with much more training in showing you how to use it. How to use the power to use the vision which you have acquired. And so it is with the current, uh, what we will call LSD scene, that is uh, raging through the United States. Uh, it unfortunately lacks discipline. And I'm not trying to say this in a kind of severe, authoritarian, paternalistic way, but only that it would be so much more fun if it had it. In other words, when people try to express what they have seen in this kind of changed state of consciousness, they show five movies going on at once. Uh, projected upon torn bed sheets with stroboscopic lights going as fast as possible at the same time and 11 jazz bands playing and uh, they're going to blow their minds baby <laughs> and every, everybody else who hasn't seen this thing look around and say well it's a mess I don't like the looks of it let's suppose that while you were very very high on LSD, you looked into a filthy ashtray and you saw the beatific vision, which is of course the case because uh, wherever you look, if you, I, your eyes are open, you will see the face of the divine. Then you come out of your ec ecstasy with the dirty ashtray and say to everybody, here it is. <laughs> no. There is a possibility, if you are an extraordinarily skillful painter, or even photographer, of presenting the dirty ashtray so that everybody else will see almost what you saw in it. But you will have to have a technique which will translate every grain of ash into a jewel. Because that's what you actually saw. But that requires mastery of an art. And I'm afraid uh, people think that all it's necessary to do is uh, just throw out any old thing because under that transformed state of consciousness any old thing is the, is the works. But nobody else can see it if they haven't shared that point of view. So then, uh, this becomes for us in the United States an extremely important social problem. The cat is out of the bag. We are living in a scientific world where secrets cannot be kept. And anyone, anytime, can uh, pick up something which will short circuit all the ancient religious techniques yoga practice, meditation, etc., etc. This is all very embarrassing, but it will happen, not for everybody, but for a lot of people, and they will see what all those sages and Buddhas and uh, yogis and uh, prophets saw in ancient times, and it will be very clear. So what? So, you see, you can say, look at all these people who haven't seen it. 
This is a temptation. Look at them all going about their business, earning money and uh, grinding it out at the bank or the insurance office or whatever it is every day and how serious they look all about it and they don't really know it's a game. And you can, uh, you can cultivate a certain contempt for people like that. But it's very, very bad to do that. Because, of course, don't forget, they have a certain contempt for you. You see, always the nice people in town who live in the best residences, uh, they know that they're nice because there are some people on the other side of the tracks who are not nice. And so at their cocktail parties, they have a lot to say about the people who are not nice because that boosts their collective ego. There would be no other way of doing it. You don't know that you're a law-abiding citizen unless there are some people who aren't. And if it's important to you to congratulate yourself on being law-abiding, you therefore have to have some criminal classes outside the pale, of course, of your immediate associates. <laughs> on the other hand, the people who are not nice, they have their parties. And they boost their collective ego by saying that they're the people who are really in. Whereas these poor squares who deliver the mail faithfully and uh, who carry on what you call responsible jobs, they're just dupes. Or when they earn their money, all they do is they buy toy rocket ships with it and go ro roaring around and so on. And that's, they think that's pleasure. So the people who are not nice boost their collective ego in that way. Neither of them realizing it that they need the other just as much as a flower needs a bee and a bee needs a flower. So you, when you see the people who you think are not in on the secret, you, if you really understand, you have to revise your opinion completely and say that the squares are the people who are really far out because they don't even know where they started. <laughs> See, uh, an enlightened Hindu or, or Buddhist looks at the ignorant people of this world and says, my respects. Because here I see the divine essence having altogether forgotten what it is and playing the most far out game of being completely lost. Congratulations, how far out can you get? <laughs> So if you understand that, you, you don't start a war with people you might say are square. Don't challenge them. Don't bug them. Don't frighten them. The reason is not because they are immature, because they are babies and you mustn't scare babies. It's nothing to do with that. You mustn't frighten them because they are doing a very far out act. They are walking uh, on a tightrope, miles up. And they've got to do that balancing act, and if you shout, they may lose their nerve. See, that's what the, we call the responsible people of the world are doing. It is an act, it's a game, just like the tightrope walker. But it's a risky one, and you can get ulcers from it, and uh, all sorts of troubles. But you must respect it. And say, congratulations on being so far out. So now, <clears throat> this is the whole essence, you see, of seeing, if you really see into this secret, that the world doesn't contain any serious threats in it because it's all the basic you running up behind itself and saying boo to see if you can get yourself to jump out of your skin. <laughs> if you see that, be cool. That's the whole art of, uh, of Zen, you know, is, 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 is cool Hinduism. <laughs> the Hindus come on a little strong. When uh, someone like uh, Sri Ramakrishna or uh, openly, pretty much openly announces that he's, he's the Godhead, 
It's a little tough. And when uh, Sri Ramana accepts the puja of all the followers and Sri Aurobindo sits every day for darshan, it's coming on a little strong. Well, the Zen people feel that that's uh, just a bit too much. And the way they come on is uh, they, uh, they're ordinary. And uh, they say when two Zen masters meet each other on the road, they need no introduction. When thieves meet, they recognize each other instantly. <laughs> so they, they don't say anything, don't make any claims. As a matter of fact, so far from making claims, all good Zen masters say they, they, don't, they have not attained anything, they have nothing to teach, and uh, that's the truth. <laughs> because uh, the, anybody who tells you that he is some way of leading you to spiritual enlightenment is just like somebody who picks your pocket and sells you your own watch. <laughs> of course, if you didn't know you had a watch, that might be the only way of getting you to realize. <laughs> <laughs> Now, so then, if though the people who do, by one means or another, prepared or unprepared, disciplined or undisciplined, get into this kind of interior secret about the nature of the universe, and they have hitherto been insecure about themselves, and they're going to use this secret as some way of creating trouble and of stirring things up and of boosting their own inadequate character structure, which is a word I prefer to use instead of ego, then there's trouble. Because those people who are out there on the tightrope are going to get pretty scared. And they're going to call in the police and say, this has got to stop. So then, we have a situation uh, right like that now. And I want to make a few comments about it. First of all, the major group, it seems to me, that are crying panic about LSD are psychoanalysts. Uh, to them, this sort of thing is extremely threatening. Because psychoanalysis in its theory, whether it be Freudian or whether it be Jungian, has a theory of the unconscious, which is not unrelated to the general philosophy of science of the 19th century, which is that the unconscious, called the libido by the Freudians, is totally uncivilized, blind lust. For the Jungians, it may be something even more dangerous than that, because they have not settled for the idea that it's a sexual unconscious. It may be much more sinister than that. Deep down, there is the spider mother. There are the screaming memes at the bottom of that pit. And Esther Harding in her book Psychic Energy says that civilization is a mere veneer over the abysmal depths of primeval slime, in which there are the great serpents and appalling influences just waiting for a chance to get up there and raise hell. So if you are psychoanalytically oriented, you are necessarily terrified of the unconscious. But you've learned a trick. They say the old-fashioned Christians, they discipline the unconscious with a club. <laughs> Bible and birch rod, see? And they knocked it down. The Freudians said, no, this is a very dangerous creature, but you've got to train it in a different way, like a good horse trainer doesn't use the whip but lumps of sugar. But it's still the same animal. In other words, this whole philosophy of Western man as it crystallized in the late 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries is that what we call humanity, consciousness, uh, spirituality, values, is simply a veneer. The real thing underneath, the gutsy thing, is a terrible monster. And watch out for that. So anything that happens that might let that creature loose is looked upon by psychoanalysis as terrible. 
I don't, I'm not going to accuse them of worrying about LSD because they think they're going to be put out of a job. Uh, I don't think that LSD is an automatic psychotherapy at all. It, 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 it needs, uh, if you're going to use it for that purpose, uh, you need psychotherapy in the ordinary way along with it. LSD is simply an exploratory instrument, like a microscope or a telescope, except this one's inside you instead of outside you. And uh, according to your capacity and knowledge, you can use a microscope or a telescope to advantage. So in the same way, according to your capacity and your knowledge, you can use an interior instrument to your advantage. Or just for kicks. But when these people, you know, really feel threatened by this thing, they start sending around messages and public utterances which sound exactly as if they had taken LSD, had had a bad trip with it, and uh, were coming on paranoid. <laughs> and so they are spreading subtle rumors that this substance causes permanent brain damage and utter destruction of the superego. There is a, uh, there are people in New York likewise who are spreading around the idea that you see once this thing has touched you, you are as if you've had a prefrontal lobotomy. <laughs> you are somebody who ought to be put in a concentration camp because you've lost your conscience. You're out of order. Nothing more can be done about it. Now do you see how alarming that could be in our day and age? Think that your brother, your aunt has got permanent brain damage? took some LSD. You see, well, the situation is exactly parallel. You know, the thing that we learn from history is nobody ever learns from history. <laughs> Consider, just go back a few hundred years to the days of the Inquisition and realize that the theologians of the church were in those days accorded the same kind of respect that we now accord to the professor of pathology at the University of California Medical School or to uh, the professor of physics at Caltech. We think those people are real authorities. They know it works. They've experimented. They have knowledge. They're the wisest people in our society. Well, all right, a few hundred years ago, so were the theologians. And they had the same sense of responsibility towards the community that our great scientists and physicians have today. And they knew there was a thing called heresy going around that was not only capable, once you caught heresy, of <laughs> making you damned to hell forever and ever and ever to the most unimaginable tortures that would go on without end, but that it was infectious. And one heretic would soon make other heretics. So those entirely humanitarian and merciful church fathers got together and said, what are we going to do to stop this? Well, now they knew there is an eternal life beyond the grave. And so perhaps, uh, just in the same way as if you've got a cancer, and that's something terrible because it might spread and destroy the whole body, cut it out, even burn it out if you have to. And a little pain on the part of the patient and several months on the end of tubes won't be too bad for if you get rid of it. So they said, we've got to torture these people. Because they might, in the middle of this, this extreme experience, recant. And if they won't recant, we'll burn them. Because there's just the chance that in the agony of burning at the stake, uh, they will say at the end, oh God, forgive me for my sins and it'll be all right. Now realize the absolutely merciful intent behind the inquisitors. Perfectly responsible, acting on the best knowledge that they had in their day. Don't you see how that can happen again anytime? Permanent brain damage. People lost their sense of social responsibility, utterly destroyed by taking the wrong kind of drug. Now, dear friends, there is absolutely no evidence for this kind of thing whatsoever. The only brain damage that is, uh, I, I've just checked this out with the most eminent authorities in this area on the subject, that the only <laughs> permanent damage that's been perpetrated, and even that wasn't permanent, was on some cats who were given doses that would be equivalent to a human being to over 2,000 micrograms of LSD, the normal dosage for a human being being about a 1 to 200. But uh, give a cat two uh, the, the equivalent for a human being of 2,000 micrograms, there will be uh, synaptic defects 
that are called acute as distinct from chronic. That means they will disappear after a little while. Now, this has been worked out carefully. And there is no evidence whatsoever of any serious neurological damage to a human being, except in cases where A, they may have taken an absurdly large dose, or B, taken it in conjunction with some other form of drug, an amphetamine, a barbiturate, or uh, something like methadone, a narcotic, which did indeed uh, cut off the oxygen supply to the brain and therefore cause some damage. So uh, this scare talk is simply without foundation. But nevertheless, there are certain reasons to be cautious and for those who understand the operation of these chemicals to issue certain clear warnings. And this I want to talk about quite seriously. Now, this class of psychotropic chemicals, which includes LSD, mescaline, uh, and its uh, original form, peyote, psilocybin, cannabis, and so on, which is a very mild psychotropic. These do not, in moderation and proper use, in any way harm the physical organism, nor form such habits that uh, you can't get rid of them without unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. But, if you take them in absurdly large doses, you are in for trouble. I knew a Methodist minister who was a very violent teetotalitarian and became extremely sick from drinking too much milk. <laughs> so after all, if you sit down and you buy a bottle of whiskey, which you can get at any store, anywhere, perfectly legit, and you consume the one quart of whiskey in one hour, you can expect trouble. <laughs> So in the same way, if you've got LSD or something of that kind and you take a thousand micrograms because some friend of yours took 500 and you want to one-up him, uh, watch out. You're being just stupid. Furthermore, you're being rather stupid if you buy the kind of LSD that is currently being circulated in the black market. Because, for two reasons, you don't know what else is in it and you don't know how much is in it. There are two sorts of producers of LSD on the black market. One is the enthusiastic graduate student in chemistry who wants to turn the whole world on. <laughs> and his product is apt to be uh, pretty good, but excessive in dosage. And what says 100 micrograms may well be 300. There is another kind of producer who wants to make a good thing out of it, uh, or who, who wants to give you a big jazz, but he'll mix it with amphetamines. There's another more sinister kind of producer who'll either cut the amount or mix it with heroin or anything, any other substance, maybe, uh, uh, again, amphetamines or, or whatever, who will get you hooked on it. So you, there is no control of the quality of what is being circulated, none whatever. And you just don't know what you're getting. Now, this situation is the result of the fact that the United States never learns from history. It is the same old story of prohibition. To think the naive notion that you can control something that might turn into a social evil by handing it over to the police. Now, after all, who pays the police? You do. And if you can't control yourself, the police won't control you either. But in lieu of controlling you, they can suppress you. Now, in all conscience, the police have enough to do. Not only to control the traffic, which is, gets worse every day by virtue of Parkinson's law, but also all the possibilities of robbery, violence, murder, and so on and so forth, which is a full-time job. But to ask the police, to go and look for people who have LSD or marijuana or heroin or opium or whatever, or who are living irregular sex lives or who have a gambling joint or a whorehouse, this is to ask the police to act 
as officers of the state in service of the church, uniformed ministers. And that's not their job. And when the police are asked to do that, uh, they are put by lawmakers into a position which brings them into public disrespect as it did in the days of prohibition. It is not fair to the police. Because if you send the police to hunt out LSD, it is a far more tough job than looking for a needle in a haystack. LSD can be disguised as anything whatsoever. It can be mixed with gum and put on an envelope. It can be entirely absorbed, vast quantities of it, into a piece of Kleenex. The alcoholic base is then allowed to evaporate, and nobody would know it from any other dirty piece of Kleenex that somebody stuck away in his pocket. It can then be reactivated. It can be made into lacquer to coat pins with. Uh, anything. It can be disguised as peanut butter, orange juice, aspirin, uh, just sugar, anything you want. And it's very difficult indeed to detect. So when you try to suppress that sort of thing by law, you leave the gates wide open for every kind of blackmail. You want to get rid of your wife or your unfortunate business competitor? Just slip them some and then arrange by a roundabout way to tip off the cops. The senator you don't like? Political rival? Psst. You see, any law of this nature, any law which in a way tries to enforce by the power of the state private morals or your own business in looking after your own nervous system is in effect an unenforceable law and all unenforceable laws lead to blackmail and to public demoralization. The only way to handle a thing of this kind is to bring it all out into the open. Nothing can be controlled when it's driven underground. It ought to be controlled. Just in the same way as we have learned how to control automobiles, we license people to drive them. So in the same way, uh, we don't sell liquor to minors. Uh, we expect them to have some kind of education and grown up responsibility before they go boozing around. So in exactly the same way, society has got to face the fact that it's going to have to license people for certain spiritual adventures or perhaps just plain pleasures if that's what you want to call it after all you can't even join uh, some churches without can't join the catholic church without taking a course of instruction and that takes a few weeks and then they put you through an initiation and you may say when you get through that well what was all that preparation for i didn't feel anything <laughs> But so in exactly the same way with this, it is completely urgent, in other words, that we prevent the occurrence of a very serious, socially destructive criminal situation created by law. You've heard of iatrogenic diseases. That means diseases caused by physicians. There are nomogenic diseases, or shall we say nomogenic crimes. Like somebody said, the only serious side effect of marijuana is that you may go to jail. <laughs> this is a nomogenic crime. In other words, it is a ritual crime. In exactly the same way that when the early Christians refused to burn incense in front of the Roman gods, in whom the Romans themselves didn't believe, they were guilty of a crime. It was a ritual crime. And they refused. And a reasonable man like the Emperor Marcus Aurelius said to the Christians, now come off it. Really? Do you have to refuse to burn incense? They said, yes, we're serious about it. <laughs> so these are ritual crimes. And so in the same way, uh, various ritual crimes exist, and our police, poor devils, are supposed to enforce it. And if they don't, they're going to get it from the politicians. Because the politicians have made all the old ladies uh, up in Glendale scared and Pasadena and so on. They're all just terrified about this. And... Uh, so the politician gets the votes of those old ladies. And the police have to do what the politician tells them to do. And you know, the police, uh, they're just people. <coughs> and, uh, it's a terrible thing to put the police in a position where they're going to earn public disrespect by enforcing or trying to enforce unenforceable laws.
So I would say in general, to sum up, substances like LSD, which give away a secret about the nature of the social game, the human game, and what underlies it, are potentially dangerous, of course. Like any good thing is, electricity is dangerous, fire is dangerous, cars are dangerous, planes are dangerous, but not so dangerous as driving on the freeway. <coughs> the only way to handle danger is to face it. If you start getting frightened of it, then you make it worse. Because you project onto it all kinds of bogies and threats which don't exist in it at all. So this is also a rule. And please, anybody here who's a psychotherapist, if he doesn't know this already, take note. If you get someone thrown on your hands who, as a result of taking any psychotropic drug, is in a psychotic state, don't be frightened. Because the moment you're afraid, your patient will pick up your fear by kind of osmosis and get worse. The rule about all terrors, going back to where I started from, the dweller on the threshold, the rule for all terrors is head straight into them. When you are sailing in a storm, you don't let a wave hit your boat on the side. You go bow into the wave and ride it. So in the same way, old folklore says, this is an old wives' tale with a lot of truth in it, whenever you meet a ghost, don't run away. Because the ghost will capture the substance of your fear and materialize itself out of your own substance and will kill you eventually because it will take over all your own vitality. So then, whenever confronted with a ghost, walk straight into it and it will disappear. And so in the same way, when people uh, stir up the depths of the unconscious and are confronted with their own monsters, or with the terrors of discovering that they're in a relativistic world where black implies white and white implies black, so who's in charge? You know, grandfather's dead, father's dead too, this leaves me. Ooh, who's the authority? <laughs> <laughs> See, when you get that, that sense of terror, go right at it, don't run away. Uh, explore, feel fear as completely as you can feel it head straight into it. And just it so happens that these things give you the property uh, and the opportunity, let me put it that way, the opportunity to go into some of your very, very most closely kept skeletons. And the result of that is invariably beneficial. <laughs>